From Montana's news leader, this is the MTN 10 o'clock news. Good evening and thanks for staying up late with us tonight. I'm Russ Reesinger. Have you noticed those vote yes for public safety signs popping up across Billings? They're reminding voters about the city's public safety mill levy election next month. Those mail in ballots get mailed out on Friday. Q2's Jay Cohn breaks down the choice for voters and what's at stake for the city. It's the election no one is thinking about. Before the big national election grabs all the attention, Billings voters will consider a public safety mill levy that helps fund the city's police, fire, and 911 services. Because of COVID-19, this is not the conversation about adding resources to really drive down crime rates, reduce response time. This is really about retaining kind of the status quo and not sliding backwards. City Administrator Chris Kokulski was not in Billings in 2014 when the city's last public safety levy went down to defeat. But he knows it was close, within a thousand votes. And Kokulski hopes this time around will be different. I wish I could say it, we could do that with less people, but this is a people business. You know, somebody dials 911, they want a human being to show up for their emergency. If they're a victim of a crime, they expect someone to take the time and work them through the criminal justice process and hold whoever the perpetrator is accountable. And it just costs more today than it did 15, 16 years ago when the voters approved the current levy. Budget-wise, the city's police and fire departments still rely on funding from a 2004 levy that raises $8.2 million per year. The city wants to repeal that fixed amount levy and replace it with one that collects 60 mils worth of property taxes. So the voters say, no, we'll continue to collect the 8.2 fixed amount. If they say yes, we'll go 60 mils. And as our tax base grows, we will bring in more money to help deal with the increased cost of public safety. Bottom line for taxpayers, the proposed levy will cost $475 a month for a median home worth $212,000, $57 a year. Kukulski hopes taxpayers will recognize a wise investment when they see it. It's an investment worth looking into. You know, public safety has a significant impact on the value of our assets, homes, businesses, properties. So to be able to continue to do what these two departments do for us um, is important. The bottom line for the city is the cost of paying for public safety is going up each year while the city's ability to pay for it is stuck at 2004 funding levels. Thursday, we'll hear from Police Chief Rich St. John and Fire Chief Bill Rash to get their perspective on public safety in Billings. I'm Jay Cohn reporting for MTN News. Thanks, Jay. Earlier tonight, city officials discussed the public safety levy at Amen Park. The presentations are happening in each ward of the city so voters can learn about and ask questions about the proposed levy. There's another forum set for tomorrow night. That will be at North Park. It starts at 7 o'clock. The economic downturn in Wyoming has forced Governor Mark Gordon to cut $250 million out of the state budget. Gordon says the cuts are difficult and there are more coming. The Department of Health will see a $90 million cut, including programs that assist low-income residents and senior citizen services. Higher education will be cut by $67 million, $42 million from the University of Wyoming, $25 million from community colleges. Another $23 million will be cut from the Department of Corrections. 274 state jobs were also cut today. The governor of Wyoming is required to balance the budget each year. The third night of the Republican National Convention with much of the focus tonight on military and law enforcement. Second lady Karen Pence talked about the role of military spouses and gave a shout out to Jillian Hall Johnson, a culinary artist who opened the Sassy Biscuit here in downtown Billings. But it was Vice President Mike Pence who was the featured speaker of the night as Republicans tried to portray themselves as the law and order party. So let me be clear. The violence must stop, whether in Minneapolis, Portland, or Kenosha. Too many heroes have died defending our freedom to see Americans strike each other down. We will have law and order on the streets of this country for every American of every race and creed and color.
Meanwhile, protesters marched through the streets of Kenosha, Wisconsin late tonight as tension remains high over the police shooting of a black man, Jacob Blake, who was shot in the back multiple times. Meanwhile, a white 17 year old teenager was arrested today after two people were shot to death during a third straight night of protest in Kenosha over Blake's shooting. Several NBA and MLB teams walked out of their games tonight in protest of that shooting as well. Hurricane Laura is headed for landfall on the Texas Louisiana border and it could be a storm for the record books with a storm surge of up to 20 feet, some 40 miles inland. CBS's Maria Villaria has the latest. Lake Arthur, Louisiana is already feeling the first lashes of Hurricane Laura. It's a very healthy storm and what that tells us is there's still actually room for further intensification. As the Gulf Coast braces for Laura, Governor John Bell Edwards warned of flooding, saying Louisiana has not seen potential storm surge this big in decades. You're going to hear the word unsurvivable to uh, describe the storm surge that we are expecting. In southern Louisiana, the Duffy family filled sandbags to protect their home from rising water. It's possible that it could go into doors, garages, whatever. So until the pumps catch up, you always have an issue with street flooding. As time to evacuate was running out, Texas Governor Greg Abbott made a last minute plea. We urge everybody who may be in harm's way to take these few last hours to get out of harm's way. People in Port Arthur boarded buses to other parts of Texas and out of the storm's path. I left a whole lot behind, but, uh, you know, just trying to get to safety. Okay. I never left, but yeah, I had to do it this time. Some evacuees are being housed in hotels because of coronavirus concerns. Shelters in Texas and Louisiana are filling up fast, and right now we know they are doing everything they can to keep these evacuees safe from the storm and the virus. Everybody comes in, we're spraying hands, we're taking temperatures, and we're keeping people social distancing, and we're doing every precaution that we can do because of the pandemic. Forecasters say 30 million people are in the path of this giant storm. Mireya Villarreal, CBS News, Beaumont, Texas. Rob Griggs joining us tonight. And Rob, this is certainly not looking very good right now. Really a powerful hurricane. Well, it could be an historic mm -hmm. storm to where it would surpass all the records in the Gulf Coast area. So we're watching and uh, fearful and prayerful and all of that. Uh, at the moment, a Category 4 expected to be a Category 5 as Laura slams into uh, sort of the uh, border between Texas and Louisiana. Uh, again, they're working, worried about these deadly 15 to 20 foot storm surges. They are virtually unsurvivable. And this is a current look at that right now, probably still a couple of hours from landfall uh, expressly. This is a quick little check of the forecast map. We follow this, and by the way, that is a tropical storm designator. It's actually a hurricane right now, but we can see uh, by, and if you add a couple of hours there, it's actually gonna be at 2 a.m. Thursday, and then you advance that on, you can kind of see the positioning of the storm by the time around 8 a.m. tomorrow morning hits. So it will be a nasty night for our friends in the Gulf Coast. What about us? Well, we'll have the complete area forecast for you in just a little bit, Russ. All right, thank you, Rob. Last week, we told you that around 30 inmates had tested positive for COVID-19 at the Yellowstone County Detention Center. Although the jail staff can segregate those inmates who test positive for the virus, overcrowding at Montana jails remains an issue. As MTN's Andrea Lutz reports, it's a problem that likely won't go away even when the virus does. When the Montana Supreme Court asked judges across Montana to release nonviolent inmates from Montana jails, to reduce the spread of COVID-19 in March. I think we were down to about 330 to 340 inmates at one time. Yellowstone County Sheriff Mike Linder had an instinct the virus would show up in his jail anyway. We knew those people would be coming back, at least some of them. We anticipated what was going to happen and we prepared for it. The staff prepared by closing off sections of the jail to use for the sole purpose of quarantine, a move they made all the way back in March. Back then, Montana Supreme Court Chief Justice Mike McGrath said due to the confines of jails, it would be virtually impossible to contain the spread of the virus. We kept room available for isolation. Uh, we kept room available for quarantine, and that's what we're doing now. The, the problem is the numbers continue to grow. An unforeseen consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic that's impacted capacities at jails, 
a spike in domestic abuse cases. Well, probably because of the lockdowns and you know a lot of people staying at home, they go to jail. And, and we don't make the decision that, well, we're not going to put them in jail because of the overcrowding. They, they end up in jail and we make room for them. In just a few short months, the jail's capacity has grown once again to numbers in the 500 inmate range. We're crowded and, uh, and we're dealing with it. 80 of those inmates are Department of Corrections holds. And while overcrowding is an issue in most Montana's jails, Linder says those inmates will not move anytime soon, especially with new COVID cases. We pretty much anticipated that that was going to happen, and you know we weren't sure if we were going to get another um, spike in uh, COVID activity in the jail or not. Um, but, but we've got a great staff down here. They do a good job. We've got 24-hour medical, and so they're able to keep an eye on things and manage it, and that's what we do. In Billings, Andrea Lutz, MTN News. Thanks, Andrea. Today's inmate capacity at the jail is roughly 480. Linder also tells us when COVID impacts the jail, each inmate is tested. Ahead on the MTN News at 10 here on Q2, ranchers working with Congress and the Trump administration to help prevent forest fires. We'll have that story coming up. And football season about ready to get Scott started. We'll check in with Scott about that.